Hello, thanks for tuning in today. Our topic today is weight management and weight loss. So I'm gonna go ahead and pull up my PowerPoint here. Um, so again, our, our topic today, we'll be talking about weight management. Um, this will be a two-part lecture. So I'll try and get through the first 25 slides or so today, and then I'll finish it up um, for you in a different uh, file so that you can watch them on two separate days if you want. Okay, um, so when we think about energy balance, again, when we think about weight management, weight loss, those types of issues, the most important thing for us to keep in mind is this concept of energy balance. So again, our biggest concern is, um, you know, what is the exchange or the, the ratio um, associated with how many calories are we taking in in comparison to how many calories we are burning? Right. Um, so this level of energy balance is going to greatly influence how much energy we're storing. So, again, if we're cons over consuming calories, we're going to store those in the form of triglycerides or fats. Um, and again, it's just based on this simple equation related to how much am I bringing in and how much am I utilizing or burning. So um, two different types of, of energy balance that we can have. Um, certainly if you were maintaining your weight, you would have kind of this perfect energy balance. Um, but if we're not maintaining our weight, then we either have what's known as a negative energy balance or a positive energy balance, depending on what's going on. So negative energy balance, again, um, means that I am um, taking in less energy than what I'm expending. Right, so I'm burning more energy than that which I'm consuming in that particular day. So that'll result in weight loss. Again, when we think about weight loss, um, it's usually a combination of both lean body mass and fat tissue. Um, we can do a lot of things in order to kind of um, maximize the quality of tissue that we maintain. So again, if we use um, proper nutrition and aerobic exercise and resistance exercise together when creating this negative energy balance, we can really minimize the amount of lean body mass that we are losing um, you know, as a result of that process. So when we think about positive energy balance, again, in this scenario, we're bringing in more calories than that which we are expending. So this will result in weight gain. Um, and what situations would a positive energy balance be appropriate or good? Um, you know, two, I guess, kind of standard situations to think about. Number one is as a child um, or anytime you're going through a growth process. So um, from, you know, well, before day one up until when you reach, you know, full adulthood, um, we have a positive energy balance because we are growing. Okay, so as part of the regular growth process um, during childhood, adolescence, um, we will see a positive energy balance in those particular individuals. During pregnancy is another example of when positive energy balance is a good thing. Um, again, you wanna gain between one to two pounds per week um, in the second and third trimester of pregnancy. So again, it's important that we are consuming a little bit additional calories um, in that particular scenario. Uh, the last scenario, you know, when we think about positive energy balances, if there's an athlete who's interested in uh, weight gain for their, you know, to maximize their um, sport success, um, that would be another scenario where we um, would desire positive energy balance. But for the most part, when we think about the average person, um, you know, and the average American for sure, um, this concept of negative energy balance is going to be more appealing to them and kind of more, I would say, more important um, to the general person. So again, if we create this energy imbalance in a chronic state, meaning that I have this positive energy balance day after day, week after week, month after month, and so on and so forth, um, this can result in obesity. Again, we could, oh, sorry. 
look at obesity as it relates to BMI and a BMI standard of greater than 30 and also body composition. So again, greater than 25 for our males, greater than 35% for our females um, would be how we would classify an individual. Um, again, when we think about body fat percentage, um, this is important because a high amount of body fat percentage or putting ourselves in that category of um, obesity, for example, um, links us to an increased risk for many health problems. Okay, so um, that's, that's a really important thing for us to think about. These aren't just arbitrary numbers that some fancy person threw out like, oh, you know, like these numbers sound good. I like threes or whatever. Um, when we think about these percentages and we think about these numbers, these are here because um, if I'm above these levels, it's putting me at risk for many other health problems, including several different chronic diseases. Um, also, and again, we'll talk about this more in this particular unit, but we find that body fat distribution is also an important uh, predictor of health risk. So where I'm actually storing this fat is important for us to consider when trying to understand or trying to get a good grasp of what your health risk is. So again, you know, we think about this concept of energy balance, whether it's positive or negative. Um, we said it was really made up of two components, um, the amount of energy that we're bringing in. So obviously that's the nutrition side of things, but also how much energy am I, I expending, right? So what is my energy output, okay? So we're looking at, you know, really one side of the equation here. We've spent obviously most of the semester talking about the other side, talking about what it is that we're consuming in regards to not only calorie quantity, but also quality as well, right? So there are three different components associated with energy output or our energy expenditure. Um, number one will be our resting metabolic rate or um, basal metabolism. And this represents the minimum energy expended um, to keep our body alive. Okay, so this is just the base amount of calories that I need to just simply survive um, and not do anything above and beyond just surviving. Okay. Um, this will represent about 60 to 70 percent of our total energy use and um, includes processes such as maintaining our cardiovascular system, respiration, and maintaining body temperature. Okay. Uh, the next component is energy for physical activity. And this can be 25 to 40% of our total energy expenditure. Um, a lack of physical activity is one of the major causes for obesity within our country. Um, so that amount of calories that we're expending when we think about physical activity can vary substantially from person to person. So again, not only are we talking about exercise in this particular category, but we're also talking about physical activity. So, you know, what's your occupation? How many steps do you take a day? Um, you know, are you sitting all day? So again, those little things kind of add up um, outside of, you know, structured exercise as well. And then third component is the thermic effect of food, and this will account for five to 10 percent of our total energy expenditure. And this basically just accounts for like the calories that we need in order to break down and uh, digest and absorb food particles so that we can use them as um, their usable form of energy known as ATP. Okay. So again, you've got resting metabolic rate or basal metabolism, um, energy for physical activity, and the thermic effect of food. Okay. Um, so, you know, there, there's a lot of, of I don't want to say debate, but a lot of theories out there um, looking at the relationship between nature versus nurture as it relates to body weight and also our ability or our capacity to lose or gain weight. Okay, so nature versus nurture. So nature, again, we're looking at this genetic piece and nurture would be looking at the behavioral piece. Now the issue with trying to separate these two things, as we talked about in our last unit, is that you are getting both of these from your parents in most cases, right? So unless you are adopted, you're receiving both genetics and behavioral techniques or um, 
habits, I should say, from your families, from your parents, okay? So let's take a look at the role of genetics. Um, again, genetics could play up to 70% of our body weight, I think I said 60% in the um, last unit that we went over. Um, so somewhere in that range, it can, it can make a substantial difference. So check this out. In studies where identical twins were raised in separate environments, they seem to show similar weight gain patterns, overall weight and weight distribution, okay? Um, so again, genetics we believe can account for up to 70% of our body weight and we can also inherit specific body types, right? So again, um, if we were in the regular classroom, I would have each of you raise your hand. How many of you have the same body type as mom or dad, right? Um, so again, other things to think about with this is maybe you don't currently have that body type, but if mom carries a lot of weight in her hips and thighs, ladies, that's something that you need to be aware of that you might have also um, inherited as it's related to a genetic piece, right? So again, think about those different body types, guys. Same thing, you know, if, if dad has a lot of weight stored in his stomach area, that's something that you're going to need to kind of keep an eye on um, as you get a little bit older. So again, we can inherit those specific body types. So, you know, one theory that we see, which I think is super interesting, um, associated with weight management is this idea of a set point. And this set point is a range that our body likes to stay within, right? So the set point theory states that, you know, my body wants to be at 150 pounds. And basically, like if I, um, you know, try really hard and I really watch what I eat and I really up my exercise routine and that sort of thing, I can decrease about 10%. I can get myself down to 142, okay? Um, but, you know, then I start to slip my, um, you know, I stop paying close attention to what I'm eating and maybe I back off a little bit on the exercise intensity or something along those lines. And I find myself sliding back to this 150. Imagine the other scenario. I want to try and gain weight, right? And so, you know, I've been really like lifting a lot and eating a lot of quality foods, such as um, foods that are high in protein, healthy fats and things like that. And I'm doing really great. I'm able to get myself up to 157. But if I don't stay on top of that, and maybe I miss a few of those weight training sessions, and, um, you know, I forgot to pack my snacks, um, you know, for this week when I bought groceries or whatever, I find myself slipping back to this 150 mark, okay? Again, maybe some of you can relate to this idea. Maybe some of you can't. Um, I would say for myself personally, I totally 100% relate to this set point theory. Um, in the summer, I'm right around a certain amount of weight. And again, I've weighed the same amount since I was like a senior in high school. And that's kind of like my racing weight. So again, as a triathlete, um, that's my race season or my competition season is in the summer. And so I'm doing a lot of training, especially because I don't work a whole lot in the summer. So I have more time to train as well. And so um, I find myself slipping down to this particular weight. And then in the winter, you know, I'm doing less training because I'm not riding my bike outside as often because of weather and things like that. And um, so I see my weight kind of drifting up a little and then it'll drift back down for the next, you know, for the next summer, for that next competition season and so on and so forth. So again, it's only, you know, maybe five pounds difference that I'm really kind of fluctuating here. Um, but the set point theory certainly, you know, makes sense when you think about that particular example. And again, maybe you agree with this or not. Um, so some researchers believe that this theory is not true at all. And some believe that we get this set point from our genetics and that, you know, this is the weight that your body feels comfortable at. And that's the weight that your body's going to work really hard to kind of stay at. So I have a couple different studies to look at this set point theory. Um, again, this study is done in 1975. So certainly in a classic study, it's, it's an old study, um, but really a key piece of this evidence that we have related to the set point theory. So let's take a look. So the Vermont prison study. So what they did was they took men that were in um, prison in Vermont and they had them over overeat, 
Okay, um, so let me find my notes here. So it was a 10 week study and they had them consuming about 5,000 to 8,000 calories per day. So that's a lot, right? So that's more than double what most of you are consuming every day. So they were having these men eat a shit ton of calories, right? Um, then they watched over the 10 weeks and they wanted their weight gain to be substantial. So these men gained an average of 36 pounds and the weight gain was about 15 to 25% of their initial body weight. Once the study concluded, most subjects returned back. There's one fly in here and it's so freaking annoying. He like won't leave me alone. Anyway. Um, <laughs> once the study concluded, most subjects returned back to their initial weight within a few months. Okay, so certainly this supports the set point theory. Um, when the study concluded, they were allowed to return back to their normal dietary habits. They could also then begin exercising, you know, whatever they're allowed to do in prison. I don't know. They get like an hour of, um, activity time, I think. I'm kind of making that up. I think that's true though. Um, whereas during this 10 weeks, they had minimal physical activity going on. Um, one thing to note with this study, I think that's really important, is that the men that were chosen had no family history of obesity. So maybe from a genetic standpoint, these men were not predisposed to have obesity. Um, again, another thing that's important to point out with the study, 1975, right? Obesity wasn't as prevalent then as what we see now, you know, many, many years later. So an interesting study, I think, to still um, really support the set point theory. So again, you know, what's, what's the deal with this as it relates to the science? So some research has suggested that the hypothalamus uh, monitors the amount of body fat in humans and it tries to keep this constant over time. Again, this might vary slightly from person to person, right? What's a normal or a good body fat percentage for you? You know what I'm talking about. Like some people are just more lean than others kind of naturally without really doing anything, without really trying. Um, so maybe their hypothalamus has a different number kind of plugged in as it relates to the appropriate amount of body fat. When I reduce calorie intake, such as if I diet, I'm going to see a decrease in thyroid hormone and this will decrease my basal metabolism about 10%. Um, so again, if I take in less, my body does go into, maybe you've heard of this before, like the starvation mode. Um, and that's kind of actually true. So again, we see a 10% decrease in how many calories you're burning just at rest just by restricting your calorie intake. So again, it's a protective mechanism for your body to try and keep you at the same weight or at that same body fat percentage. That makes it harder, harder, significantly harder for us to lose weight in that particular scenario then. Yep. Yeah, so it'll decrease your basal metabolism about 150 to 300 calories per day. So it's like you did all this work to try and watch what you were eating and that sort of thing. And then your basal metabolism just decreased a lot right along with it. So it's kind of like sucks, right? If this was, if this is actually true, this is one of the reasons why losing weight is so difficult. Um, here's another kind of look at the set point theory. And again, I've got some things to kind of go against the set point theory here coming up. Um, but basically, if a person overeats in the short term, okay, um, their basal metabolism will increase in order to resist weight gain. Okay? Um, however, if the person overeats in the long run, they'll reach a new set point. Okay? Um, resistance to weight gain is much less than resistance to weight loss. So as you know, it's much easier to go this way than it is to go down and go back to here, right? Um, so again, you know, our resistance to weight gain is significantly different or significantly less in comparison to our resistance to weight loss is significantly harder. Okay, so again, um, basically, you know, we can continue to go through this cycle as adults and um, continue to kind of establish new set points if we stay at a particular weight for an extended period of time. So um, those are all kind of pieces of evidence to support the set point theory. Those who oppose the set point theory 
have these questions. I'm sorry. Have these questions. Why then, if if we have the set point and all these checks and balances put in place to keep us at a certain weight, why does our weight gradually increase each year, even as adults? So again, you know, we gain approximately one pound every year during adulthood in the United States. So if we had a set point, we shouldn't be gaining weight. We should be able to maintain our weight as adults. Okay. Um, again, another kind of piece of evidence to go against the set point theory, our country's set point continues to increase as obesity continues to grow. So each year, the average set point is continuing to increase in a linear fashion in the United States. Last piece of evidence, when people move to the United States, they, it doesn't matter where they came from. They come from Africa, Europe, Asia, Australia, wherever these individuals come from, their set points automatically increase. What I'm trying to say is anyone who moves to the United States gains an average of, I believe it's like five to six pounds within the first six months of them living here, okay? So if I had a set point, that wouldn't happen, right? So certainly there are many environmental factors and things that we are choosing to do that have played a role in whatever the set point is in the United States, right? So again, people of every ethnicity, race, background, wherever they come from, it doesn't matter. We're seeing an average weight gain of five to six pounds um, just from coming to our country. Again, that takes care of all those genetic pieces, right? Um, anyone is gaining that amount of weight, not just, you know, a certain ethnic background or, or something along those lines. So um, that's, a, I think, an interesting point to, to keep in mind as well. Um, again, you know, we think about what's what's happening in the United States as it relates to obesity. Um, look at the increase here. So again, we're at, you know, 35% for um, men and over 40% for females as we look at obesity, right? Um, unfortunately, you see this overweight kind of going down a little bit. That's because they've changed over into the, this category or maybe even this category, right? So when we think about obesity as it relates to people within our country, you know, like, like you learned in that fed up um, documentary, we're continuing to increase this number each and every year, which is super scary. Um, again, you know, you think of this, this role of nurture and, and we know that nurture or behavior, the behaviors that you learn must be important in this. If we're continuing to gain weight, regardless of all of these checks and balances that are kind of put in place. So while we may resemble our parents due to the genetics that we've inherited, we also inherit certain lifestyle habits from them, including cultural diet and activity habits. Okay. Um, so again, I want you to, you know, reflect on your own family, especially now as you're spending more time with them. What cultural habits do you have? What nutritional habits did you get from them? And what about activities? Um, what have your parents modeled for you in regards to activity at an early age? Were you out playing catch with your dad in the backyard or your mom, right? Did you guys go on family bike rides on Sunday afternoons? Um, what were you eating, right? Was, was there fruit at every meal? Was there vegetables? Was there pie at every meal, like in my family? Um, so again, think about these habits that you're getting from nurture, right? Um, another, I think, interesting thing to think about, um, married couples tend to behave similarly towards food and have similar degrees of leanness or fatness. So again, I think this is really important when you think about if, if your health is important to you, this is really important when you think about choosing a partner, right? If you're up here and you're eating healthy and you're exercising regularly and you're doing all those things and um, everything's great and health is important to you and you're dating somebody or you're with somebody who mm, they don't really care about their, what they're eating. They just like to, you know, they love pizza or whatever, and they don't really like to exercise. They'd rather, you know, watch movies or, um, you know, I don't, 
know what people do that don't exercise. I'm sorry. <laughs> they're watching movies or they're playing video games or they're reading books. I don't know what they do. So again, if this is your partner and this is you, imagine that you're going to come to a point of um, equilibrium, right? So sometimes they're going to get you to watch that movie, but sometimes you might get them to go to the gym, right? Sometimes they're going to get you to order pizza with them, but sometimes you're going to get them to eat a salad that you made or whatever, right? So again, you're going to reach an equilibrium with them. So if you choose someone that already has those same values, then maybe they're going to bring you up, right? So again, think about those things. I think it's kind of interesting to um, think about that when you're I guess, choosing a, a partner, you could say. Other environmental factors to think about when we think about weight gain or weight management. Sleep is one. Um, so reduced amount of sleep has been associated with being overweight or having obesity. Um, so if I'm more tired, I'm less likely to exercise or I'm less likely to get much out of that exercise, right? Maybe I'll do like a light 20 30 minute walk whereas if i was well rested maybe i would do a hard high intensity um, workout that was longer right um, if i'm awake more often there's more chances for me to eat okay so again i'm going to consume more calories if i'm awake for a longer period of time um, being overweight can also cause sleep apnea so that can become an issue as well that's something to think about emotional restraint Emotional stress um, perceived as an emergency, the body feels like they need to eat more and then and therefore can store fat. Um, so again, um, cortisol can stimulate calorie intake and fat um, can then be stored within the intra-abdominal fat storage locations. So again, what I'm trying to say is when you're under emotional stress, it can increase fat storage in your abdominal region, okay? Um, you also, as a learned behavior, will eat more when you're stressed. Again, a lot of people are stress eaters. Um, that's not actually your physiological response. Your physiological response to stress is actually to increase your metabolism. So you shouldn't be gaining weight. However, we learn a learned behavior is to eat when we're stressed, right? You choose comfort foods, you choose ice cream, or you choose, I'm gonna go to the bar with my friends or whatever. So um, those extra calories are all behavioral changes, not necessarily a physiological need for those things. Um, emotional stress can vary from person to person, right? What stresses out one person um, might not even phase someone else. So again, it's all about how you perceive that particular situation, if you perceive it as threatening, then it will cause you stress. If you don't perceive it as threatening, even though it might be the same exact situation, then you don't experience stress. Okay? So again, it's important to kind of think about your perception of that and what you could do to kind of control that. Uh, personal relationships, this is interesting. Research suggests that social and family relationships may contribute to weight gain right? So again, maybe I am less likely to be active. I'm more likely to go out to eat if I'm in a relationship or I'm hanging out with my friends. Um, so again, those can contribute to weight gain. I'm certainly not suggesting to not do those things. I am suggesting, however, that you be the positive influence on these other people in your life, right? How could you promote health within your social or family relationships? Can you go on a walk together? Um, can you um, eat a healthy meal, cook a meal together? Um, so again, thinking about ways that you can promote health within these um, relationship statuses that you have. Okay, a person's chance of becoming obese increased by 57% if a close friend became obese within that same given time frame. So again, think about who you're spending time with. Are you spending time with people that are making you better or are you spending time with people that are bringing you down, right? Similar findings with siblings and spouses as well. So again, be careful who you surround yourself with. Think about the influence of these other people on your choices as it relates to your health. 
what how it relates to what you're eating and if you if you're exercising and how much and, and those types of things so again be the positive influence and then be careful with who you spend your time with um, other environmental factors alcohol um, consuming alcohol certainly rich in calories um, if consumed in excess which we always do because we're college students um, stored as fat alcohol um, intake doesn't suppress appetite or fat intake um, if anything it can do the opposite of that so it can increase your appetite so again or maybe it just decreases your inhibition so you tend to overeat when you're drinking anyway um, or you know you're up later at night so now I want to eat more because I eat dinner at seven you know, six o'clock and now it's midnight or whatever, and now I'm hungry again. Um, so alcohol can cause us to consume extra food calories in addition to the calories we're getting from the actual exercise as well. Okay. Um, nicotine, so this can actually inhibit our appetite and increase our resting energy expenditure. Um, it is a stimulant. I'm not suggesting that you use it, certainly not. Um, the health risks associated with nicotine are significantly greater than you know these two health benefits that we see right here but if we stop smoking this can lead to weight gain but this is okay um i think that not that i not my personal opinion this research shows that smoking is actually significantly worse for us than being obese or overweight so it would be better to stop smoking and actually gain this weight and then worry about the weight after you're not addicted to smoking. Um, so again, average is 11 to 13 pounds and two years of weight gain um, following the um, you know, stopping of smoking essentially. So when we think about you know, weight gain, obesity, health, the other thing to note, and again, I could talk about this for many hours, um, is the cost of obesity. So according to the Centers for Disease and Control, the CDC, um, the cost, the health costs of obesity um, are similar to what those are that we see with smoking as well. So estimated per capita costs of being overweight or obese, um, being overweight costs $266, being obese, $1,700, right? Um, respectively with an estimated total cost of over a hundred billion dollars, right? Five percent of healthcare spending is just related to weight, right? Um, isn't that crazy that we're spending over a hundred billion dollars on something that we know exactly how to prevent, right? That just blows my mind. Um, so the majority of the healthcare costs associated um, with this are related to cardiovascular disease and cancers. Not only are we willing to spend this much money on a weight issue, we're also willing to like get diseases that can actually kill us and do actually kill us. Two of your major um, causes of death in America, cardiovascular disease, disease and cancer. Guess what? We can prevent most of these by watching what you eat and exercising regularly. So I don't understand, it's really hard for me to be able to understand what's going on in the head of somebody who isn't willing to um, take care of themselves and put their health you know, as a priority here. Um, so again, I'll stop on my rant with that, but um, it's just crazy to me how much money we're spending on this um, because people are not taking care of themselves. Um, location of body fat, how does this affect my health? Um, so again, you know, we talked about really two different types of, of um, fat storage. So I can be apple shaped, which is storing fat in the abdominal region. And this is generally known as visceral fat. So it's stored around the um, organs, the vital organs within the abdominal area or the thoracic area. Or I can be more pear-shaped, which is shown here. Um, and this particular body type, we're more likely to store fat in the hips, butt, thigh area. Um, again, this is more common in females. The apple shape is more common in males. Um, which is worse? 
Um, it show, research shows that being apple shaped is worse because we don't like to have um, that fat stored in between our organs. Um, the reason that's, that's bad is it can trigger inflammation, which can be a major issue. It can also um, cause some issues with insulin resistance. So it can um, lead us to type two diabetes as well. Um, can also lead to another chronic disease, which is known as metabolic syndrome. So that can be an issue as well with this particular type of fat storage. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately for you, depending on who you are, you don't get to choose what body type you have. Again, where you're going to store body fat is pretty much genetic in nature. Um, there's a few things that we could probably do to kind of help eliminate this um, abdominal adiposity. But again, some people are just going to tend to store more weight in the hips and thighs, and that's just their genetic predisposition. So. Um, this is more dangerous. However, you don't really have control over where you store that fat. Um, speaking of fitness and fatness, this is interesting. Um, when we think about being um, fit versus what your body weight is. Okay, so here we're looking at um, mortality rates and kind of how we rank as it relates to um, both your fitness level and your um, fatness level or your whether you're obese or not okay so if I'm fit and I don't and I'm not overweight that's the lowest mortality rate so that's good um, mortality rate so basically we're looking at how many people are dying within this category this is the lowest mortality rate the next lowest rate is fit and fat so it's actually better for us to be overweight and exercise regularly than it would be for us to be skinny but sedentary, which is your next category up, okay? That's a huge selling point, I think, when we think about exercise and its value. You don't even have to lose weight in order to gain the benefits of exercise. If I exercise regularly, even without weight loss, I am better off than somebody who's skinny and not exercising, right? Um, certainly our highest mortality rates then are going to be people that are not exercising and that are experiencing obesity as well, right? So kind of the double whammy there. Let's see. Look at my notes here for that one. Tucker had something to say about that. He has a lot to say about it. Um, a couple slides about weight loss and then we'll, seriously, dude, we'll end for the session here. Okay, so when we think about weight loss, some of the basics of weight control. Hey, you want to say hi, Tucker? Go, go lay down. Go lay down. we think about the basics of weight control um the you know the easiest thing to think about is creating this calorie deficit right so essentially in order for us to burn one pound or in order for us to lose one pound we need to create a deficit of 3500 calories so again i need to expend 3500 more calories than what i'm consuming in order for that one pound of weight loss to occur Um, when we think about safe weight loss, okay, again, what can I do without medical supervision? Um, the maximum amount of recommended weight loss for adults, one to two pounds per week. For growing children, one pound per week. Again, realistic goals, good goals for these particular classifications of individuals. Um, adults, about one pound per week. Growing kids, half pound per week weight loss. Um, again, Slower weight loss is actually better because then I can maximize the amount of weight loss that's coming from fat as opposed to lean body mass. So that's important. Um, again, we want to set realistic goals. Um, maybe they are related to appearance, health, sports performance. Just a couple examples there. So we think about behavior modification. Um, the, the key first step or the first step to um, kind of making this change is diet and activity diary. So again, research shows that um, people that write down 
what they're consuming and what they're doing from an activity standpoint um, are significantly more successful at weight loss or behavior modification than those that aren't. Um, again, hopefully you've kind of um, seen or started to pay attention to what you're consuming and what you're doing. A lot of times it doesn't match what you perceive. Um, and I find myself doing this as well. Um, I eat pretty healthy. Um, I would say I eat really healthy in normal circumstances, but um, once in a while I'll start to write things down and realize, oh shoot, I didn't have any fruits yesterday. Oh, I only had three servings of vegetables or whatever. So again, a lot of times what we think we're doing and what we're actually doing don't necessarily line up, which is why this diary is important for us. Um, again, we should establish long-term and short-term goals. Um, in the long term, again, maybe we want to lose 10 to 15 percent of our uh, body weight over four to six months. That's an example. Again, short term goals are to lose maybe one to two pounds per week. Again, um, small behavior changes. So again, we should focus on making small modifications instead of just a complete overhaul of our lives. Um, nothing builds success like success. So again, do something small reach that goal, gain your confidence, and then shoot for the next goal. So some suggestions to um, think about when we think about behavior modification, um, self-discipline, self-control come, I think a lot, of, a lot of this comes from having strong motivation to want to change, right? You have to have a good reason why you want to do this, why you want to achieve this. But then secondly, you have to plan. You have to be very good at planning, um, plan things out in advance. Think about what foods you wanna eat, food purchasing, storage, preparation, and serving um, location. Where are you eating? Restaurant eating, methods of eating, activity, and then mental attitude as well. So again, let's take a look at some of these things. Foods to eat. Again, choose healthy foods. Sounds pretty easy, right? Um, use low calorie healthful foods for snacks. So some great examples of snacks, um, an apple, a bag of um, grapes, a rice cake, popcorn, okay? So those are all examples. Carrots and hummus. So those are all low calorie um, healthy snacks that would be great, right? Plan low calorie high nutrient meals, okay? So again, those high nutrient meals when they're low calorie, have to be pretty much full of fruits and veggies, right? Plan your food intake for the entire day, right? Plan out what you're gonna eat for breakfast, lunch, and dinner so that you know exactly what you're gonna be consuming throughout that day. Um, eat foods that require no or minimal processing. So again, try to avoid um, your highly processed foods. Allow yourself small food, small amounts of foods that you like, but stay within those daily caloric limits. So if you freaking love chocolate, don't try and say like, oh, I'm never having chocolate again until I reach 100 pounds or whatever, you know, whatever that goal is. Um, that's not good. You want to enjoy your life too. Um, so allow yourself small amounts of the foods that you like, but stay within those limits. Know the food exchange system. Um, particularly, we want to know portion size and also um, high fat foods as well. So again, we've got to be educated on um, the calorie content and what's going on with each of those foods that um, we desire. Food purchasing. Don't shop when you're hungry. That's a bad thing. That's bad because then you end up getting, you know, the frosted animal crackers and then you go over to the bakery and maybe you're going to grab some cinnamon rolls too. And, oh, I'm going to grab some chips and dip and I might grab a thing of sushi on my way out the door and I'm definitely going to get a pop too. Um, so don't shop when you're hungry because we tend to um, make bad decisions then. Prepare a shopping list and don't deviate from it. That's not something I'm great at. I make a shopping list of things that I don't that I buy that are not like um, my staple items, but I never write down things like eggs or milk or bread or, um, you know, like salad or stuff like that. Those are all standard things that I get no matter what. So I don't necessarily write those down. I just like wait and see what looks good, but you'd be better off to prepare a shopping list and then only buy those things. Cause then you don't end up getting the animal crackers cause they weren't listed on your shopping list. By only nutrient-dense foods, so again, 
buy good foods. If you have shit food in your house, guess what you're going to eat? You're going to eat the shit food, right? So if you don't have that available at your house, you have to go somewhere to get it. You're going to think twice before you make that decision, right? Um, if it's in your house, it's tempting. If I don't have it, then I don't have to worry about it. Read and compare um, food labels. So again, you can do that at the grocery store and, and look and see, um, you know, what's the difference between those whole wheat tortillas and the low carb tortillas. So again, thinking about those things is important. Um, buy natural foods as much as possible. So um, I always go to the produce section first, right? I'll get as much fresh produce as I possibly can a bunch of fruits, a bunch of veggies. Um, I try to do that. And then I also always keep a couple bags of frozen vegetables and fruits as well. So I get like the um, frozen mixed fruits. I, keep, I have two bags of that in my freezer and then um, all sorts of frozen veg veggies to keep in there as well. They're all just natural things, right? Um, so that's gonna be your best bet. Fresh, frozen, canned. That's kind of the order I would say um, with those things food storage and prep. So again, keep high calorie foods out of sight. So don't leave those cinnamon rolls sitting on the counter, put them in a cupboard, um, have low calorie snacks like carrots and radishes readily available. So um, one thing that I'll do when I get home is I wash and I um, take the grapes off of the veal. Dog's back over here. <laughs> I, and then I put them in, you know, like Ziploc bag or whatever. So they're ready to go for a snack. Um, for my husband, I'll also like get, you know, when I get almonds or whatever, I'll put them in little single serving Ziploc bags so that he can take those with him to work. Um, so it's already planned out. It's already ready to go. Buy mainly foods that require preparation of um, some type. Um, I'm not huge into that, but again, um, if you do that, then you're going to have to think about what you're eating before you eat it. Um, I'm a very simple, you know, I'd be happy to eat carrots and hummus and, and grapes and apples and all those kind of just simple things. Um, again, those are easy and healthy though, right? So if I have foods that need to um, have some preparation, then you have to think about it before you go to make it then. Don't add fats or sugars in preparation if possible. So um, again, maybe put, you know, the non, non cook, non, non stick um, spray or, you know, a little dash of olive oil or something like that. Um, we don't need a cup of butter in there. Um, you don't need to add a bunch of sugar. So again, you know, thinking about kind of minimizing those things if you're cooking, um, prepare only small amounts be able to visualize one serving for any given food. Um, if you make a big amount, then I only portion out, okay, here's what I'm gonna eat for dinner. And then I'm gonna portion it out for, you know, two meals of leftovers the next, you know, for however many, you know, the next days or whatever. Um, so I think proportioning those out is, is good. Okay. Um, don't use serving bowls on the table. So, um, you know, fill your plate with what you think you need and then go sit down at the table. Maybe keep all the other stuff on the counter um, so that you're not tempted to just continue to grab a couple more spoonfuls of goulash or whatever it might be. Put the food on the plate, preferably a small plate. Okay. Location, where should we eat at? Um, eat only in one place, such as a kitchen or dining room. So don't eat on the couch while watching TV. Avoid food areas such as a kitchen or snack table at a party. Um, avoid restaurants where you're more likely to buy high calorie items. That would be all restaurants for me. So uh, I don't know what to tell you about that. Um, I think that when we think about that scenario, because again, I have no self-control when I go out to eat, just minimize the amount of times you go out to eat. Maybe you go out to eat once every two weeks or something along those lines. Um, and then that kind of takes care of that factor. Restaurant eating. When eating out, try to select low calorie items. Request your meals um, to be, be prepared without fats if possible. I don't know. I don't know. Um, have condiments like butter, mayonnaise, salad dressing. Those can be put on the side um, so that you can decide how much you put on those. 
Um, try to order water, iced tea, Diet Pepsi. Um, those are all calorie free or very low in calories um, versus a high calorie beverage, you know, such as like a nice fancy good beer or like a um, smoothie, something along those lines or like a pina colada. Um, any of those things are going to be high in, in calories. And then um, be wary of portion sizes at the restaurant. So again, they're gonna give you a huge portion. Um, so maybe ask for a, a take home box um, when they deliver your meal so that you can put half your meal in that box. Okay, so I think we'll stop there for today. And um, like I said, I'll, create, I'll finish the rest of that PowerPoint in a separate file for you to kind of break things up.